So, hi everyone. I'm thrilled to be back here this year again. I'm delighted and I'm very thankful to the organizers uh, for inviting me again this year. Um, because the most important reason that I am here is because Julian cannot be here. But I do have something from him. <laughs> um, this is a drawing that Julian made in Belmarsh, which he gave me permission to show you today. Um, the serpent is uh, inspired by a painting by William Blake. I know that once Julian is free, and I believe he will be free, he will be speaking to you and all people who value the basic freedom to speak and associate freely. It is not a cliché to say that it is up to us to free him. It really is. And the reasons to free him are abundantly clear. He is a target of a brutal, unprecedented injustice. But this year I want to talk to you about the broader implications of his freedom for this community and the role that this community plays in safeguarding freedom of speech. Now, you will have to forgive me for invoking the United Nations. I know many of you are probably skeptical for good reason. Um, but the specific thing I want to invoke is the foundational document of the UN human rights system from 1948, uh, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and the way that the drafters chose to define freedom of speech. Article 19 of this foundational document states, everyone has the right to freedom of opinion and expression. This right includes freedom to hold opinions without interference and to seek, receive, and impart information and ideas through any media and regardless of frontiers. This is 1948, and I find this definition really insightful because it breaks down this freedom of speech into the act of seeking, receiving, and imparting information. When Julian established WikiLeaks in 2006, he found a way to put subjugated history into the public domain. As you know, WikiLeaks transformed access to information forever. Julian built WikiLeaks as a decentralized online library, the Rebel Library of Alexandria, he called it. The decentralized aspect allowed it to be censorship resistant. Cryptography provided a, gate a gateway for the whistleblowers and the sources to bring censored documents into the public domain and to do it anonymously. Prior to the internet, censorship had focused on preventing the act of speaking, of imparting information. But with the internet, censorship has become increasingly more sophisticated. And the question is no longer whether the truth can be spoken, but whether it can be heard and seen. The focus of censorship has shifted away from actively curbing the act of speaking to manipulating the ability to seek and, and receive information. This process has accelerated over the past seven years or so. It is so comprehensive, so co coordinated, that it is attempting to destroy the public domain itself. I don't think this is an exaggeration. The rise of the censorship industrial complex has transformed the information landscape. The censors are a network of actors and hybrids, government, the press, NGOs, think tanks, social media companies, academic institutions. They service the new economy that promotes the notion that information is dangerous and that the public's access to it involves risks that must be managed. Democratic processes are problematized and even true and newsworthy information is cast as a potential threat because nefarious entities could exploit the, the information. The censorship industrial com complex grew out of two significant uh, shocks to the system in 2016. One was the British voters' decision to Brexit. The second uh, was Donald Trump's victory in the presidential election. And one of the factors which the Clinton campaign blamed for its loss was WikiLeaks' publication of the DNC and Podesta emails, 
which revealed how the Clinton campaign had rigged the primaries against its rival in the primaries for the uh, Democratic nomination, uh, Bernie Sanders. And the Clinton campaign, it was revealed in these documents, in these emails also, had interfered in the Republican primaries by deploying what it called the Pied Piper strategy, um, which was to boost Donald Trump's um, visibility, exposure in the media through its network in the mistaken belief that Donald Trump's exposure would lose votes to the Republicans. <clears throat> While the Clinton campaign and much of the Democratic um, establishment cast WikiLeaks' publication of the DNC emails in a negative light, when the DNC tried to file a lawsuit against Julian and WikiLeaks um, for the publication of the DNC emails, the court viewed the publication very differently. The court threw out the lawsuit on First Amendment grounds. And in dismissing the, the case, the court described the publication of the DNC emails in the following way. It was a publication of matters of the highest public concern. The DNC's published internal communications allowed the American electorate to look behind the curtain of one of the two major political parties in the United States during a presidential election. This type of information is plainly of the type entitled to the strongest protection that the First Amendment offers. You probably didn't hear about that ruling. The dis dismissal of the lawsuit and the reasons behind it were barely reported on. With no apparent pushback or counter-narrative, the censorship industrial complex was allowed to flourish. By 2020, two of the central players of this censorship industrial complex, the Aspen Institute and Stanford University's Cyber Policy Center, had found a formula um, to prevent true information from informing the democratic process. The strategy was to convince reporters and social media companies that it was time to introduce a new set of norms and break with what they called the Pentagon Papers principle. The Pentagon Papers are often cited as a precursor to WikiLeaks publication of the Afghan and Iraq war logs. Um, it is also a sort of myth of origin uh, of the press freedom in the United States. It is a moment in history when, despite legal attacks on the publishers, the New York Times, the Washington Post, and dirty tricks against the whistleblower, Daniel Ellsberg, uh, the public interest prevailed and the foundation for future publishing was set. <clears throat> that foundation remained strong up until the Trump administration decided to indict Julian under the Espionage Act for the act of publishing and news gathering. But let's go back to the Pentagon Papers. The Pentagon Papers leak happened 50 years ago and it was an internal Department of Defense uh, report uh, which was leaked by Daniel Ellsberg and it was published by the Washington Post, New York Times and revealed how the administration had been lying to the American public and also um, to Congress about how the war was going and the end game in Vietnam or lack thereof. The Aspen Institute and Stanford Cyber Policy Center in 2020 didn't alle allege that the Pentagon Papers principle was illegal. They argue that there should be a change of norms, a change of institutional culture in the um, media houses and social media com companies. The press and social media should adopt the role of the censor. The considerations of potential harm, vaguely defined, should weigh more heavily than the newsworthiness and authenticity of the information that malicious actors could exploit the information and the public must be protected from its own reactive instincts. It basically invites all these different players to participate in a social construct that is projected onto uh, the public and which obscures reality. The censorship industrial complex's big debut was a breathtakingly effective suppression of the Hunter Biden laptops story. To begin with, the media pre-bunked uh, the story. The New York uh, Post sorry, had hardly broken the story um, before it was declared to be a disinfo op. The pre-bunking was significantly 
uh, bolstered by a public statement signed by 51 former intelligence officials affirming that the laptop belonging to Hunter Biden uh, was disinformation, that it was bogus. Twitter famously suppressed links um, to the story on the New York Post website. Uh, Mark Zuckerberg told Joe Rogan uh, that Facebook had suppressed the Hunter Biden story after a call from the FBI telling them to do so. Uh, the laptop was authentic, of course. It wasn't a disinformation, um, and the story was effectively buried in the lead-up to the 2020 election. It happened quickly, it happened effectively, including through a tabletop exercise at the Aspen Institute with all these players who later suppressed the story, um, which was essentially a dry run for breaking uh, for the time when the Hunter Biden story broke in the New York Post. The truth eventually came out. Earlier this year, Mike Morell, the former CIA deputy director, testified before the Senate Judiciary Committee. Um, and he said that the current Secretary of State, Antony Blinken, who at the time was a senior advisor to the Biden administration, instigated uh, the, public, the bogus public statement by the 51 former intelligence officials. The Twitter files, various Senate hearings, Missouri v. Biden, uh, case have all revealed a great deal about uh, the censorship industrial complex and how it is undermining the, the um, public's First Amendment freedoms. There's plenty of material out there, but the importance and implications of these events have been downplayed by the players, like the press, who of course are not neutral bystanders. bystanders. <coughs> Meanwhile, Legislation like the online safety bill in the UK or the EU's Digital Services Act and similar statutes around the world are transferring the power to moderate content online from tech companies uh, to governments. Um, these types of uh, forms of legislation impose a, a duty of care onto tech firms um, and uh, including incentives and, and pressure points to censor harmful but legal content. The case of the extraordinarily popular podcaster Russell Brand shows how public officials are now using their new powers uh, to pressure platforms into demonetizing specific content creators. I'm sure you're all aware of the context. Allegations, some of them criminal, have been made against Brand in the media. YouTube immediately announced it was demonetizing Brand's channel almost immediately, and the BBC and Channel 4 in the UK deleted their historic content containing Russell Brand. Um, whether he is eventually charged with a crime or convicted of it in the future, um, the fact is that the cancellation has been sudden and it has a final um, quality to it. The most disturbing aspect of all of this, apart from the apparent irrelevance, of uh, the legal presumption of innocence is that the most aggressive push to demonetize Russell Brand came from the chair of the UK Parliament's Digital, Cultural, Media and Sport Committee, the lady over there whose name is Dame Caroline uh, Dinage, who wrote to TikTok and Rumble demanding that they disclose whether Brand was making a living from the content on his channel. And the real target, of course, isn't brand. It's Rumble. It's the, it's the content uh, platform. It is a, a form of eliciting compliance. And the powers to elicit that compliance um, have, have been adopted in uh, multiple jurisdictions through these types of legislation. Dame Caroline Dinage isn't just any conservative MP, member of parliament. Uh, she introduced the online safety bill and her husband, over there, is Mark Lancaster, who, until recently, was the deputy commander of the 77th Brigade. Now, what is the 77th Brigade? According to the BBC, the 77th Brigade is made up of, quote, warriors who don't just carry weapons, but they are also skilled in using social media, such as Twitter and Facebook, and the dark arts of psyops, psychological operations. So, while the censorship industrial complex continues to grow, the world's most famous 
freedom of speech champion remains imprisoned. Those who have put Julian in prison are the same ones who fear true information reaching the masses because they fear what the public might do with information that can change the status quo. The criminal case against Julian criminalizes the act of publishing. The public interest of the documents that WikiLeaks published is not in question. He faces 175 years. The authenticity of the documents is also not in question. Uh, it documents the killing of tens of thousands of civilians, evidence of war crimes, political interference in judicial processes, complicity in torture of multiple countries, etc. It is the act of publishing and what Julian uh, stands for which is being punished, and it is being an, made an example of the punishment through his imprisonment. Julian is, after all, the greatest contributor to the historical record and its most ardent defender. He's imprisoned because of his role in bringing subjugated history onto the public record of growing the historical record and of protecting its integrity. He built WikiLeaks to encourage access to public in in interest information by providing a means through which sources could provide information anonymously. Julian also recognized the potential for Bitcoin and its role in, in contributing to the preservation of the historical record. And he recognized this early on. In 2014, he appeared as a hologram in Nantucket, Massachusetts. And he told the audience that the underlying architecture of Bitcoin um, provides public value beyond the obvious financial innovations. Uh, he explained how during um, the USSR, um, when Stalin died, Beria fell out of favor with the new power factions, and uh, there was a decision to remove his entry from the official encyclopedia, and so a, an order was issued to remove the pages contain, uh, containing Beria's biography and to expand the entry about the Barents Sea. And uh, so this was done, but this rudimentary form of censorship was obvious. You could see the glue um, where the pace, pages have been uh, replaced. Maybe you could notice the texture was different between the different pages and so on. But during um, altering history, hiding the censorship became very easy during um, when, when the internet uh, appeared. There was no glue, no visible, visible texture um, to indicate that there had been an alteration to history. Bitcoin technology, Julian told the Nantucket audience, could defeat internet censorship. It allows the proof that a particular thing was published at a particular time. It breaks Orwell's dictum. You do not control the future if you, cannot, if you are unable to alter the past. Nine years ago, WikiLeaks used the blockchain technology to show proof of publication through publishing a hash. I was lucky that while I was preparing this speech, this project appears, appeared, uh, an anonymous group called uh, Project, has started Project Spartacus, um, which puts this idea into practice. It uses um, the Ordinals protocol um, to uh, inscribe the WikiLeaks Afghan war logs to the Bitcoin blockchain. And um, you can look it up, uh, projectspartacus.org. Last night, there were 252 Afghan war logs that had been inscribed, and there are 76,000 to go. Um, so do look into it and participate. Um, the Afghan war diaries, if you're wondering what the content is, um, <clears throat> were published in 2010, one of the publications for which Julian is facing um, 175 years in, um, for publishing. Um, they cut through the fog of war, revealed some 20,000 um, deaths, including uh, at least 195 previously unreported deaths of civilians committed by NATO troops. So Julian created WikiLeaks as the Internet's own lab, uh, rebel library of Alexandria. 
WikiLeaks would give asylum to the world's most persecuted documents, they would find a safe haven, and they would be secured and made accessible. The integrity of the historical record was assured. It was not just secured, but also imparted, sought, and received by the public. In 2012, Julian wrote a call to cryptographic arms. He sounded a warning, what he called a watchman's, a watchman's shout into the night. This is a quote. Recall that states are the systems which determine where and how coercive force is consistently applied. The question of how much coercive force can seep into the platonic realm of the internet from the physical world is answered by cryptography and the cypherpunk's ideals. As states merge with the internet and the future of our civilization becomes the future of the internet, we must redefine force relations. If we do not, the universality of the internet will merge global humanity in one giant, into one giant grid of mass surveillance and mass control. He published this in 2012. The censors are not just after Julian and WikiLeaks. The objective is not simply to suppress recent history. Julian's ongoing imprisonment has emboldened the censors. They have turned their sights to the present, seeking the total control over the public domain itself. Our voice and our ears are collective reality. A world in which Julian is free is a world that will continue to build initiatives that recognize what we are up against. Free Julian, free us all. Thank you. Welcome back again to the Bitcoin Amsterdam Live Desk brought to you by Bitcoin Magazine. Uh, we just concluded an awesome day one of content here uh, in Amsterdam. Uh, Stella Assange returned for a sobering discussion again uh, on her husband Julian and the human rights violations committed uh, against him by various governments around the world. This talk had a lot of parallels to the uh, fourth turning discussion that was just had by Mark and such. Uh, Stella brought up some great points uh, with the Pentagon Papers, <clears throat> excuse me, with the Pentagon Papers being released 50 years ago um, and, you know, the media covering it and having no issues uh, with addressing some of the, the issues brought on by the government. And then now, fast forward, uh, previous election cycle, obviously, um, uh, you know, we had the Biden laptop situation and that was obviously a no-go. Uh, but just curious to hear your thoughts, Chris, on um, you know what were some of the what were some of the important important discussion points that Stella brought up, and uh, how is we are we as Bitcoiners uh, you know marching forward towards uh, free and open systems? Yeah, definitely. So one of the main points that she brought up was the censorship industrial complex. I thought that was a you know good take on the military industrial complex that we're seeing in the world right now. Another point that she brought up is free Assange, free the world. I want to just also add free Snowden and free Ross. You know, I think it would be a highlight of one conference, hopefully in the near future, to have Julian Assange, Edward Snowden, and Ross Ulbrich all at a conference together and basically, you know, with the power of Bitcoin and freedom technologies in order to counteract many of the things that the oppressive governments or even companies have been doing in the last decade or so. Yeah, absolutely. Alex, to you. Yeah, I think Stella nailed it. I mean, if you want freedom of speech, if you want freedom of publishing and you want to be able to say something in this world without being censored and surveilled, you need to embrace these tools. I think all Bitcoiners, non-Bitcoiners sitting at home they need to embrace Noster, they need to learn to use Tor, they need to try the latest software products and hardware products because we need market feedback, we need to make our tools more robust to fight against the encroaching surveillance state.
Yeah, I think Jack Dorsey had a great tweet the other day basically talking about there's only three technologies that he sees at this current moment that are mo uh, robust enough or decentralized enough, those being Tor, Bitcoin, and Noster. Uh, there's some funny comments of people saying, not this, what about that? And he was like, nope, I didn't stutter. It's these three technologies. That right, are. <laughs> right. Well, it's interesting that you bring those up, right? Uh, you know, growing up, we've been taught that, uh, you know, capitalism is great because it drives innovation in markets. And for the longest time, it was this competition amongst companies. But... What we're seeing with the products that you just brought up, uh, it's no longer competition amongst uh, various corporations, but it's this, this distinct battle between freedom and authoritarian uh, oversight on everything that we're doing. Um, you know, going into, uh, you know, this, this the happening and everything, uh, certainly we're going to see a lot of uh, attention on Noster, uh, on uh, freedom money. Uh, we had the, you know, a year ago, the convoy with uh, the, the truckers in Canada that had their banks accounts frozen. How much longer before everyone has just said, hey, we've had enough? Like, when, do, when does everyone finally opt out? Uh, I think we've kind of seen things swing from more centralized to more decentralized. You know, the pendulum swings. It's not a straight line. So I definitely think uh, the time is near. And I think a lot of people are waking up, whether it was 2020, 2021, 2022, that people are really seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. I know things are more different, uh, more difficult from an economic backdrop of the current years. But I do think with the halving, I, hopefully, and uh, a lot of the ETF talk, uh, hopefully we'll see a pump and, you know, we'll get onto the next bull market. Certainly, those are fantastic words. Um, I do want to recap some of the rest of the day that we had some great uh, announcements put on today. I know some by Trezor, uh, Blockstream. Uh, Chris, could you run me through just kind of what your favorite part of the day was? Yeah, definitely having Edward Snowden. I know we brought him up before. Free Snowden, free Assange, free Ross. Uh, I think it was a very good talk and talking about, like, not just freeing ourselves, but freeing the masses. I know that's a more difficult thing to do. He said instead of being a niche community where the products and services that we have only help us or the cypherpunks or basically the people that are looking for freedom, but helping make it easier for the masses to onboard. Uh, he had a great quote basically saying, you know, instead of slipping through the keyhole of sovereignty and safety to avoid the government or the uh, repression of regime, it's definitely really great to use these tools or make them easier for the masses, for sure. Yeah, the beauty of these tools is you don't have to ask permission to go out and develop, you know, fork them, create your own versions and let the market decide what they need, or perhaps you just need a tool just for you. It's a beautiful thing. So I think uh, between Stella and Snowden, just that urgency, that call to action, you don't need to ask permission, but we need to act now. I mean, we're on our back foot here. We've got about, you know, 12, 6 to 18 months after the halving before the spotlight becomes on Bitcoin again and perhaps by proxy uh, Nostra as well. And we need to be ready to onboard as much of the world we, as we can. So we need to make these tools easier to use. We need to make it easier to understand, increase our education initiatives and um, kind of have more competitive options on the market for people to choose from. Do you see uh, any potential issues? Uh, you know, you mentioned, you know, the having's upon us and that there might be this rush of interest in using some of these clients uh, like Noster, whether it's through Damus or whatever. Um, do you see any are, there any, are there any issues with a massive influx in user base or do you think that's only a net gain? No, it's a huge gain. We've seen it before. Um, you know, the other day, actually, I forgot to mention Stella, Assange and Gabriel Shipton, uh, Julian's brother, both joined Noster. And that these kind of uh, people taking interest in our technology brings with it a huge wave of people from Twitter and other platforms just to see what they have to say. You know, you get a little bit of social, cultural buy-in and the network handles it fine. I mean, that's the beauty of the descent. We're not relying on one server, you know, at Elon's house. <laughs> you know, we're all running our relays at home, so it's beautiful, you know? Do you think uh, you think Elon and X are making some of the right steps in the right direction? Do you see, do you see a potential in the future where X and uh, Noster end up, marrying one each uh, end up marrying each other? No, not at all. It's not possible. I mean, Elon knows about Noster. He pays attention to it. But uh, he's taking the company in the other direction. I mean, it's not the path of most pr profitability, and the incentives aren't there for him, personally. So, but for us, the people, you know, the little guys that are under the surveillance <laughs> regime, you know, if you're living in Saudi Arabia and you want to say anything, it's very useful to generate a private-public key pair and send your statement to the world pseudonymously. That's a huge thing that we Westerners don't understand. I mean, that happens on Twitter. People try to do it. They get disappeared in other countries.
for critiquing their government. So yeah. it's it's important tools. Certainly something we take for granted. I mean, uh, I think here in the West, more so what we see are high-profile individuals. I mean, obviously, the Alex Jones, more recently, Russell Brand, um, and that sorts. But, uh, you know, we should feel blessed that we have the ability to use these tools. And uh, going forward, I do, every, I do encourage everybody, if you haven't already gotten on board at Anastra, please go download Damus or something like that. Get on board and follow McShane, follow Chris. They're on there. Yeah, um, yeah. Can, I, can I just point out, you yeah. don't have to sacrifice any personal information to use Nostra. That's the beautiful thing. So right. there's no data on most of the major clients. There's no data collected on you at all. It's not the Twitter thing where you sign your life away, give them your home address. No blue Social Security mark. number. Yeah, <laughs> Snowden <laughs> said, you know, some, some picture, you know, hostage picture with your ID. No, you don't have to do any of that. No. It's inc incredible, incredible. Well, I do want to shift focus here for a second. Uh, I know uh, we have some exciting talks upcoming tomorrow. Uh, Alex, walk, walk us through what we can expect to hear on the main stage, uh, and what are you most excited about? I'm excited for the BIP 300 debate with <laughs> Chuck, Mo, and Paul. I think it's going to get a little t contentious. If you've ever joined Paul's um, you know, three-hour spaces about BIP 300, they're pretty fun. He's a very entertaining guy. Um, I'm super excited. I've got a panel about Noster. You know, I can't shut up about it, so <laughs> we're going we're gonna to get deep into it on the main stage. Um, there's also a, not a debate called not an ordinals debate That's with most Giacomo and Pete Rizzo. Pete Rizzo going uh, over one here, coming into the <laughs> inscription debate space. It's going to be interesting to see. Certainly going to be interesting to see, especially with the uh, developments of a uh, Bit VM. How with uh, with the, the Bit three or with the, the with the discussion around Bit three hundred and then the discussion around not an ordinals debate. How do you guys see kind of Bit VM kind of like? I guess, for lack of a better term, it just like audible itself in, into the conversation. And these yeah. speakers don't have a lot of time to really pivot some of their talking points. Well, it's been around, you know, some of these guys, it's been, it's been discussed. Um, Robin's been around for a while working on this stuff. So I don't think it automatically obsoletes it. But I think when you look at something like ordinals or inscriptions, I mean, it's kind of, Casey's basically trolling the whole... <laughs> the crypto community yeah. at large with just how crude this uh, instrument is. I think it'll get replaced, but I think the um, the willingness for people to try to make Bitcoin into something that is a little bit more like programmable money, I don't think that goes away. You know, for better, for worse, whatever you think, people will still keep coming back with things like BitBM to, uh, yeah, to engineer the protocol a little bit. I just hope we don't change the main layer to do it. Yeah, well, certainly a lot to be excited about tomorrow. Um, Chris, any closing thoughts here? Uh, no, I mean, uh, BitVM, I haven't even had a chance to really look at it. I know it's something that's been worked on for a while, but it's like things that, you know, go into hiding or in the bear market they're building and they're kind of behind the scenes. Definitely something that I want to look through the white paper. I know there's a lot of use cases, but then people are even saying, yeah, the white paper was written, but there's no code that can be used or reviewed yet. So definitely that's something that people are waiting to implement and look at. Uh, like I said, uh, McShane brought up, I'm really looking forward to the ordinals debate between Rizzo and Giacomo Zucco is going to probably be a really, really good one, at least spicy, I hope. I think it'll be funny, definitely. Um, so yeah, that's what I'm looking forward to for tomorrow. Well, folks, definitely make sure to tune in tomorrow. Uh, first thing, uh, first uh, panel goes off at uh, 9 a.m. Uh, so looking forward to having everybody return and uh, go buy some Bitcoin. Thank you, Miami, for the last three years in this amazing city. The whole world shut down, but Miami welcomed us with open arms. We want to show Bitcoin to the whole world. We are taking the conference on the road to set the stage for Bitcoin in a new city. Nashville. Bitcoin 2024 is coming to Nashville in Tennessee. A city that is known as a music and freedom city. Bitcoin 2024 in Nashville from July 25th to 27th.